and welcome along to another episode of the Escapade Podcast, Escapade Show, episode 24 with Mr. Darren Connell, man. Darren. Hi guys, thank you very much for asking us to come on today. It's brilliant, man. I'm it's buzzing. Good to have you, mate. I'm buzzing. Very happy to have you yes. in the studio. So, in, in the space that is Escape Studios. Uh, you were saying that uh, you're quite quite feeling the vibe when you first come in. Oh, aye, man. It's a great wee studio. It's nice and cosy. As um, uh, usually, usually, it's not with all the stops. Are you coming in the day? All of them. Aye, I just on. I just stood there for twenty minutes and watched you Hoover. Uh, Stevie, was, <laughs> no, was, you didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> it was all ready for him coming. It's like a nice artistic piece. I was like, oh, aye. Well, that partly because you came to about three years too early. I know, I know, like a fucking, you could do that at Edinburgh for a show, by the way, just hoover a carpet and you'd probably get a, a successful run. An award winning piece. <laughs> like it was just so out the box. That's proper art. <laughs> I, look, sorry for being four hours early. I didn't mean it. Mate, you know what? You're keen. That's what I like. No, Beats no. being four hours late, mate. And uh, you're not exactly the worst guy to have about coming down early, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure getting mm -hmm. a chat with you, you know, beforehand. We probably should have filmed half of that bit and then the day we might get locked up for some of the part or not. <laughs> <laughs> so Darren Connell is uh, mostly known through his uh, role as, as Bobby Muir on uh, Scott Squad. Officer Karen. Yes. And um, that, so that there in itself, hilarious, great programme. And what a, what a way to kickstart with last night. The programme actually won a BAFTA, as you do. So tell us a wee bit about um, that and what's been happening with, with the whole Scott Squad thing. Well, it's coming back uh, for a fifth series. And the Scottish BAFTAs were last night and it won Best Scripted Comedy. And it was up against some really good... It's amazing. Shows it was up against uh, Trust Me, uh, which I had a wee part in. So right. it was free. Free shows were up for a. So awards. you were winning either way. Aye. <laughs> I like so it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just one of those things. I never, I never went last night because it was quite crew heavy. I mm -hmm. knew that there was going to be about 17 people there. Mm -hmm. And I done that. Do you know what? I don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. This is for the writers and the producers and all that. And. When they won last night, I was just proud. Do you know what I mean? It's amazing, mate. I'm just grateful as well. See the feeling of gratitude. <coughs> like, I can't believe we started off as a wee show. I was still working in Asda when I'd done the pilot. Do you wow, know what I mean? Wow, man. And then I'm just like, oh, that was just such a feeling of camaraderie. Because I, I don't get that with stand up comedy. Uh, but last night I was like, oh, well done, troops, man. Give yourself, give yourself a pat in the back. Do you know mm -hmm, what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was one of the ones like your face comes up on the big screen. Sorry, I couldn't be there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, I'm taking all the credit <laughs> I for it. I wanted that <laughs> gone first. <laughs> and then, uh, no, that is amazing. That's amazing. So so I take it you've started off doing stand-up way before then. You've been doing that for a while. and Yeah, I mean, uh, quite a lot of people, I mean, obviously, no, everybody's going to know who I am. But... Mm. I started off as a stand-up. I've been doing stand-up ever since. Done my first gig when I was 18. I was really bad at it. Never started again until I was 24. And I would say I've been doing it non-stop since I've been 24. And <coughs> through that, I've had some acting jobs and I've started to do panto. And Amazing, I've done yeah. Vine as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people like watch Scott Squad and they're like, oh, there's that guy off of Vine. And right. they don't know I'm a stand-up comedian. Even the, I'd done a weekend at the stand there, Thursday to Saturday, and I went up on stage, and I could hear some of the crowd, they were like, no way, there's Bobby for Scott Squad, and I'd done 20 minutes of solid stand-up, and they were just like, I think they were a wee bit surprised, and I was like, I'm a stand-up first, mm. yeah. than anything else. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. It's funny how that happens, sometimes you get noticed for something that wasn't how it originated. It's kind of like that, isn't it? I think, I think that's the cool thing about mm. social media and stuff. Like, I seen that recently with Common, the rapper, and someone knew and they were like, oh, that's that TV star. It's like, no, he's actually, he was a rapper yep. way before he was ever Aye. on TV or anything like mm. that. So it doesn't really matter how they find out about you. It just matters that they find out about you really, innit? Aye. So then they see that other side of you and go, oh, he's not just an actor or no. It's pretty cool. So what, what do you enjoy more, the acting side or, or stand-up? It's tough. It is tough because stand up is like instant feedback. Like <laughs> you can f you can feel if you're damn poor, you know. Mm -hmm. Filming is like I filmed Scott Squad in June. It's not going to be back on until February. 
I don't know how it would be. Mm-hmm. And the two of them are totally different beasts, and I enjoy them very much. And I'll, if somebody would say, "What would you pick? Would you pick stand up or acting?" I couldn't pick. Mm-hmm. I love the both of them. Mm-hmm. I'd rather do the both of them. That's, Do you know what I mean? That's quality. No, it definitely is. So, Scott, Scott, how did that come about, the idea in general? Um, well, the writer and creator is called uh, Joe Hewlett, right. and he's a, he's a friend as well, but he's a producer and director, and he's English as well, and he moved up to Glasgow a couple of years ago, and he, he was doing stand-up as well, but he stopped doing stand-up. And started writing more? I started writing more, and I think he worked in a place called The Comedy Unit, and uh, he just approached the comedy unit and the BBC with the concept of Scott Squad. Um, there was massive uh, additions for it, and I got an addition. First addition of my life. I had a Pulisicky Fiazda. <laughs> and uh, I had turned up in my uniform. And, uh, Did you? Aye. <laughs> All these actors just looking at me and I'm fucking in a... Sorry for swearing. No, no, and no, an no, Asda uniform. So <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that shows real commitment, mate. Do you know what I mean? They can't say it. I'm a method actor. I'm meant to be in the... <laughs> I'm like that now when people are like, Dan, you've put on weight. And I'm like, ah, it's actually for a role. <laughs> uh, They've asked me to eat a lot of shit <laughs> for I, a long time. <laughs> but Dan, you've been fat for about five years. I know, but it's a play, you know? <laughs> It's a long, drawn-out <laughs> drama. <laughs> but I, and then I went down, I'd done an audition, and uh, I heard that I was so surreal and mental. They were just like, he's too mental to be a police officer. So I think for a long time, I wasn't going to get it, even though I'd, I'd done well. And I remember walking away thinking, I'd done good there, man. And I was buzzing. Mm-hmm. But... It, I was gutted because I was like, oh, I'm too cartoonish and too mental. And they were just like, you can't make him a police officer because it's just... It's, it's just, not believable. Aye. So that happened for a long time. And then they said, we can make him a nuisance or a pest. And it was literally, we're just going to make you a character that's just going to come into a police station and uh, annoy somebody behind a desk. <laughs> no, wait, so they they hadn't, Bobby Muir didn't exist? Bobby Muir didn't exist. No way. Uh, so they built it around yourself then? Aye. aye that's you must have impressed them then, mate. Aye, do you know, uh, cool. I'm proud of it, man. I'm more proud of it. And it was nice to sit down with a team of writers and we came up. Develop something? Developed it, aye. Like, uh, well, good. Bobby, a, a comedian called Gus Limburn called me Bobby Dazzler for years. Every time he used to see me, he's like, ah, Bobby, <laughs> Dazzler. <laughs> and I was like, ah, well, call him Bobby. And then Muir, uh, I kept Muir because there's a comedian called the Reverend Obadiah Steppenwolf the third, and he's a character comedian. Mm-hmm. And his real name is Jim Muir, and he was my hero. Right, so you took his like, last name. Take his last name. A wee tip of the hat. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. What, what was it like? Talk us through going for your very first audition because it's, it's a very foreign thing. I've done a couple auditions and it's the weirdest thing ever. Well, the Scott Squad, I've never done an audition like Scott Squad. That's been like, I've done auditions when I turn up with a script and stuff. And mm-hmm. to be honest, I do struggle with that. Uh, but Scott Squad was like, come in with an idea. You're, this is a, an addition for Scott Squad. You've got two options. You're either a BAM or a POLIS. And I think I went with a BAM. And I went in that day. Joe Hewlett was sitting with the director. They put a camera in front of you. You've got 10 minutes. And I just riffed. I just improved as a BAM for 10 minutes. They were laughing and they says, we want you to come back for the group edition. And it was a massive group addition. I remember Karen being there, Officer Karen, mm-hmm. and a few other cast members. There was maybe 25 people there or something, and it was just on-the-spot improv games. They were just... Because Scott Squad's partly improv. So it was just to see how you were dealing with improv games. Yeah, yeah. But I was in my element, because, see, to a point, I, I prefer improv. See, when I... I wouldn't say I struggle to read, but... I just pre- I feel more comfortable doing improv, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Yes, man, this mm-hmm. is this is my this is my game here." It's not amazing, amazing? Mate. amazing. Because I'd done stand up for a couple of years, I felt comfortable mm-hmm. doing improv in front of people as well. Aye, and I enjoyed it. I treated it like a gig. I just went in there. I mean, there's no egos. I worked in Asda. I had to go into the toilet, change my uniform, and I was just that. I'm just grateful to. I'm grateful that they've gave me a chance because. 
I never went to drama school. Uh, at that point, I was only a half decent open spot comedian. I was not like a paid regular, so I was just like, Do you know what, I'm just going to enjoy this because it could probably be my first and last edition. Mm -hmm. And I went in with pure gratitude. Mm -hmm. But I, I think they seen me just having fun as well. Like that guy's just enjoying himself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a a job or a or I'm no slagging people, but you know how you get like desperate actors like oh I need this. I need I, this role. I I was just like do you know what I'm going in for a laugh. If I don't get it, I don't get it. Aye, that's a great attitude to have though, and everything. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, the whole happiness is life minus expectations, isn't it? Totally. If you go in expecting things, <clears throat> you're you know, always going to be unhappy. If you, get, if you get let down, then you know. And just being grateful for actually being put in that position. I mean, I totally get that because, like, for Good me, attitude, for, for years sure. I went down the whole want to get into drama and like TV and all that. And then I was always kind of like, well, you've not had the formal training. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> and it's like, you're constantly like, well, what does that mean? Maybe I don't need to be like that. So for me, it's it's really great to hear because you've done that. Yeah. And you've went down that route. And, you know, for a lot of people watching as well, mate, they, they might not have that drama background, but they yeah. want to get involved somehow. It can be done. It's really down to your attitude. Yeah. And I never knew anything about drama. See, when people, see, when I was younger, I never knew comedy clubs were real. I never, stand up comedy when I was growing up was Billy Conley and Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Raw. Yeah, yeah. I never knew that you could get stand-up comedians. Uh, I never knew you could get comedy clubs. I never knew you could get drama school. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. when I was 17 and 18, uh, and then you come from a working-class family as well, and y you don't really get that, you should go for that. Yeah. So if there is no, any no. young people uh, watching, I mean, it's changed days now as well, because never had, we never had the uh, internet when we were younger. So just Google drama classes comedy clubs and you'll find it whether mm -hmm. i had to find a you know a booklet in a library somewhere and i was like oh no way man a, a drama college yeah 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 but the thing is as well though you, not not only that you could also become big by just putting out videos aye everybody's got that platform now to put something out like look at what we're doing just now and yourself with your own podcast and stuff what you were saying about vine there like people recognizing you from an app yeah Oh, that's crazy. I mean, I... That's I, on you. I enjoyed a vine. That was No, good. you did. Was that seven-second seven videos for them? Seven seconds, aye. Many loops did you get? <sighs> I don't even remember, but Mate. I mean, I, I, bre I breached a thousand a couple of times, but no, <laughs> no many. I know you, you were quite the hitter. I started just kind of getting it better, and a wee following, and then it all stopped. I was like, no way, man. I died a death, didn't I? Aye, just gone. It happened when Instagram came in with their, their videos, didn't it? Is that when that... Or was it Snapchat? I'm not entirely sure how. There was an app that kind of came in over the top. It, I think, with a, a similar thing that just went. Because with stories and all that now, you've, you've, you've got more time now. You've got, you know, you've got 15 seconds instead of the seven. The Vine thing really worked though. It did because ah, you just yeah. had no enough time to put much sense into it. So they're oh, just not meant to look like these vines. You know what I mean? Oh. Were brilliant, genius. I mean, it's changed days, isn't it? I've heard somebody say, like, doing it for the gram and all that, and you're like, that meant something different when I was younger. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, aye, it's mental. It's a, to it's a totally different... World. Aye. We find ourselves in, because all the young ones now are actually, they're being, they're in the world without knowing what the world was like without internet. Aye. So they don't know any different, which is which is a weird concept, man. I think that's so weird. You know, I was out for, for dinner last night, and there was a table right next to us, and... Um, these two girls come in, right? Ordered their food, and it all came in, and then they spent about ten minutes placing the food, oh my God. and then standing up with their cameras like that, well, like, taking shots, or getting pictures, stuff. Obviously, food but it must have went cold, you know. Yeah. Fifteen minutes, odd. I take them. Do you think they were maybe food bloggers or something? Or? I mean, I don't know, but <laughs> if you see it. It's changed. It's insane, isn't it? That, it's, I think uh, to a different extent, that's a problem as well. I think oh, that's a big an, problem. an addiction or something. It is. Uh, especially when you're seeing that. It's mm. too much. I mean, I remember I met someone for a coffee through Twitter, and uh, I wouldn't name the person, but it was something like 80,000 tweets. It was literally every single time I went on that app, that person tweeted, and I met them for a coffee, and they just sat in total silence. And trying Tweet to get a conversation. No, no, even tweeting. It was just from the person in real life to their Twitter was totally different. I, a, a persona. I and I was like, 
can I get a word at you in real life and on Twitter? I'm like, I'm you won't close shut to up. muting you. <laughs> You're doing my nothing. That's weird, that, and it? That's weird, that. I mean, look, at the end of the day, what we're seeing is like people are starting to make a living through doing things or through mm. partnership stuff and all that, which which is great. But one thing we were talking about recently is so it's like the whole Instagram influencer, mm -hmm. like influencing what? <laughs> what are you influencing? <laughs> I know, no, I mean, man. Nano's a shite behaviour, basically. I know, know. What I mean, so it's a weird, a weird space we find ourselves in. But at the same time, it's what I, it's what's allowing all of us to grow as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a happy medium, isn't it? You mm -hmm. need to also live life in the moment, as opposed for as supposed to for other people. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of the time, that's what I think people are doing. Or they're maybe looking at like a Kim Kardashian saying, man, look how perfect she is. Well, remember that picture's probably been photoshopped and they've probably taken about 600 photos before they picked one. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's scary because people are then holding themselves to that standard and they're never going to get there because it's not real. Aye. Aye. It's, Aye. it's, it's, it's worrying. I totally agree. It's worrying. Have you, seen the, have you ever seen like some of the girls sometimes when they're posing for multiple pictures, they'll maybe take... Uh, each pose <laughs> is, is so like... I guess perfect, you know, yeah. and it's, they've done it so many times, and they'll r do maybe a hundred pictures in a couple of minutes, you know, and then yeah. they'll sit and they'll just sift trying to pick the best one. I've seen it in Ibiza everywhere this summer. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's madness. What, what's going to be the outcome of that? Mental you know I mean? mental health problems. Oh, well, that's it's already. Seen. I think yeah. that's already there. Eh? Aye, and eating disorders and. I mean, guy. It's not just females. It's no, everybody. Everybody, well. man. Everybody mm. is for taking a picture of your dinner right up to the model and stuff. It's mm -hmm. just mental, man. It is weird. It's weird. And you're also seeing like uh, like people like, doing joy rides over in America and then live streaming it and all that. Aye. And they're crashing vehicles and stuff. You know, just mental uh, stuff. Or recently, I've seen online what about these idiots that are climbing up skyscrapers and stuff, and no, it's like thank you. the Backstreet Boys are playing in the background and they're doing forward rolls off 100 story buildings. No way, mate. See when I see videos like that, my feet tingle. Aye. I don't know what it is. Like the bottom of my feet tingle. I freak out when I see that. Is there something inside you that thinks, please slip? Aye, there's also Aye. that part like that. You need a lesson, mate. Aye. I don't know if death's the perfect lesson for mm -hmm. them because there's, you kind of learn it after that. Aye. But maybe a wee, you know, shattered knee bone and Aye. shoulder. I, I love it when, uh, see when fat people go on like tyre swings and they snap and Aye. they fall into the water Aye. and it's like shallow water and stuff. Like, that, yes. It's like, you know you should never do that. No, but the thing is, is when they grab the rope, they at the bottom, like, mate, clearly you need to grab above there and then they like, hit the deck before they get the wall. Oh, you're like, man, Aye. just some people, I don't know, I don't know how they, I don't know how they function. And then again, people like that do have a platform. Right. So they can just upload a video and get a million hits or whatever it may be in your league. Hashtag tire swing. Aye, you know what I mean? <laughs> it fails and all that, exactly. So I take it then with you, I mean, staying on this sort of subject then, were you starting to grow your profile? How much has social media been, you know, important to that whole situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, before I did stand up, I wasn't interested in having a smartphone or facebook or anything like that and i started mm. doing it and everyone was like you need to do more you need to get social media and honestly i, I wouldn't be where i am today uh, social media has been a big big mm. help for that it helps me sell out gigs uh my podcast wouldn't be where it was if it wasn't social media it's definitely it's something that i need in my life but i've i treat it like a not a job but i treat it like a tool so I'm not on it for, I don't just go on it for the sake of going on it yeah. because it warps my mind. So, but it helps, it helps me. It does help me. You That's a good to way to look at it. You need to separate it again, don't you? Yeah. You know, sometimes just not having the phone for a couple of days, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's quite healthy for the mind to find. Uh, do you know, I don't know if you know this, but I went to Peru in February and I went on a detox and I... Uh, took ayahuasca and stuff wow and it was for seven days right mm -hmm. and for seven days it was no bread no cold water no showers or no smoking no alcohol no drugs obviously no caffeine no phone and see out of everything the phone was the worst I felt like I was coming off a drug so you know having my mobile phone there, mm -hmm. I actually felt like I was coming off a drug. I could feel it in my, I had a physical like effect. Like anxiety kind I, of. I had a physical effect on my body. I could, there, there was something there. And I was there with my friend 
and he was like that as well. Because you felt like you needed to check I, it. I was, but it was just so much. Like it was, we were in the middle of the jungle in the middle of nowhere, right? And we were just like, see if, like, something happened. Like, How am see I if a to? world leader get assassinated. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't know. It was so mental, <clears throat> and it was definitely uh, everything I went without the phone. Uh, was the worst man it's quite eye opening mm. what, what was the, the main kind of takeaway from doing something like that like seven days was it seven days Hi, it was seven days I just I don't mean to bring that up to you know how you get the people like I've actually wrote a blog on being a vegan <laughs> and I went to Peru to take ayahuasca no, no, that's no. very interesting no it's I mean it was brilliant I just needed to test myself I felt I felt myself going into a rut like we were talking about social media and stuff it was the same old stuff uh, like having this social media persona and then my actual real person, I was like, I'm not, or I'm I'm posting motivational quotes and I'm not going by it. Mm -hmm. Going by it. Going by it. Mm. So I called my show Against the Grain, which is a term that I love, just to go against, like, if you want to achieve something, if you want to go for a, a dream, just go for it against the grain. Yep. And I called my Glasgow show that, and then I had an opportunity to, I knew someone that was doing this in Peru and they were like, well, that's, is that not the definition of going against the grain? And I caught myself kind of lying to myself thinking, see if I don't go there and do something as mental as that, then I'm lying to myself. How can you myself. preach it? How can I, you preach it? So it was just to kind of test myself because I've, I've lived in a wee Glaswegian bubble my whole life. I've never really been in holidays. I've never really done anything different. And I was like, do you know what? That's just... So alien. I so, so against uh, what I would normally do in my life. And I'm glad I've done it, man. So what to talk is you arrived there what happened what was the whole I think process it is something you sign up for or you, I guess you google it and it, you get a tour guide yeah kind of thing. didn't they travel shop and they <laughs> I didn't know that Thompson's <laughs> and that bar he traveled <laughs> one week in Peru <laughs> you get a ayahuasca <laughs> discount <laughs> discount code ayahuasca <laughs> it was it was like a, a tour guide cut. basically a fly to Peru, get picked up at the airport by the shaman. And then we went down the Amazon River in a boat. It was like uh, no. Apocalypse Now. Get to it was genuinely like Apocalypse no Now. Way. I had a weird obsession with Apocalypse Now. And I was just like, I want to do something like that, minus the war. The guys, you know, picked us up at the airport, up the Amazon, and I basically lived in the middle of the Amazon jungle in a hut. Mm -hmm. No we, way, man. No windies <laughs> and no doors. It was just a roof with mosquito netting at it. And I had a bed, a desk, a chair. And that was it. And a hundred meg fibre optic Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and a fridge with hundreds of yogurt and all that in it. But apart from that... <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no fridge. No, but... Uh, wow, man. I, it was, was it weird. just on your own? I ended up, I was going to go, my, uh, there was about 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was the only British person there, my pal came with me, he booked up last minute, but there was like, it was all Brazilians and Portuguese people. Everyone kind of soul seeking, kind of. Uh, yeah, aye, and it was, uh, that's cool, yeah. it was mental, it was so mental, like it's definitely done something to me, I've came back and I'm like. How can you go back to normal life? Because I took ayahuasca six times as well. Why you, you over there? Yeah, I wow. you get a day on, day off, day on. And uh, it was wild. And I was a lot bigger then as well. I was probably over 20 stone. I was probably 20. Solid muscle. Ah, uh, pure solid muscle. So see being that size in the jungle, mm -hmm. straight away I was just like instantly struggling. Lost my appetite. I think I went four days without food and stuff which was weird. Mm -hmm. I've never done that before. But it was a strict, they call it a dieta. Mm -hmm. They put you on a strict diet. So 10 in the morning, it was uh, rice and one potato for my breakfast, which was a tiny wee portion. And for my dinner was a potato with grains. And it was a tiny portion again. And I remember thinking, I remember doing that. That's not going to be enough for me. Like, look at mm -hmm. the size of me. I need more food. Mm -hmm. And the heat and all that completely killed my appetite uh, yeah, yeah. to the point that it got after three days and they were like, you better eat this. Mm -hmm. And my appetite was Can just eat. gone. I completely gone. Of the heat. 
the heat. And you know what? I never even struggled. I was like, I don't want to eat. Do you know what I mean? Now, the heat does that. It's strange. Uh, it's really that you don't need to eat for some reason. Aye. I take it just drinking hundreds of water. Uh, aye, but that was weird as well because I don't know why we weren't allowed to drink cold water, but it was warm water, so it was uh, it was it was tough going, man. It's just cold water like, in a hot environment can have it can have bad issues with your stomach. Oh, really? Aye, so like um, especially if you're not eating. Aye, so if you aye, just can directly your stomach, I think. yeah, yeah, if you just fling freezing water in there or whatever. Sometimes it, you notice that in the morning if you've obviously if you've been fasting during the night. Yeah. And you drink cold water, you can feel it in your stomach, and it's like, ah, yeah, that's why shock. water out the kettle or that, that's kind of room temperature's better. Yeah, and I only know that because the Italians are all mad about drinking cold water. Like, um, like you know, they're always like, it's in the heart of the summer, make sure it's warmer. Like, don't mm-hmm. just drink freezing cold. Right. Every time I'm there, I'm just freezing cold, man. I'm like, Aye. I don't care. But it's stomach Munching steel, ice man. cubes and all that. Aye. <laughs> it's just, I don't know if it affects us as much just because I've been so cultured Aye. in Scotland now. I'm just like, I'm not warm, Freezing cold cans, I am. It's roasting here, <laughs> mate. It's roasting here. Get me a freezing one. So, <laughs> so I mean, right, so, the ex- Ayahuasca. Aye, the experience of that then, like, day on, day off. I've kind of heard a bit about it, you know, and it's absolutely fascinating. Like, so... Do you go and speak to like a lady, or do, does your life kind of get laid out, and you see maybe what where you're, for you? where you improve your life in ways? And I mean, like. well, I, I went over there. I think everybody. I've got no shame in speaking about this, but everybody during their life has experienced something like stress or mm-hmm. some form of Absolutely. depression, anxiety, anxiety, loss of loved ones and stuff, obviously. Absolutely. That's just loneliness life. as well. Aye. Loneliness, definitely. So the comedian in me was like, I want to go over there because it's just mental. But I went over there for self-improvement as well. Mm-hmm. But... But a material one. Aye, it was, I mean, it was essentially to... I mean, I called my show Against the Grain, so I was like, oh, I'll go over and I'll... I'll write my show, which I had half written anyway. But, I mean, nothing... I mean, it is terrifying. Drinking ayahuasca was terrifying. It's nothing like anything I've ever done. I wouldn't even class it as a drug. I I do believe that I peeked behind some form of curtain and Mm -hmm. looked past... This is seriously interesting. Like, Mm -hmm. there there was some... Like, I took from that, there's life after death... Mm -hmm. I believe in karma mm-hmm. and energy and all that kind of stuff is mm-hmm. real. I'm getting shivers, man. Was, oh my god! I mean, it was mental. It was just mental. It was just like, how are you supposed to come back to normality? I because I remember thinking, I'm Bobby for Scott Squad. <laughs> 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 how am I supposed to get back to spring? I live in Springburn, and uh, but you take it. It's three things in it. No, obviously this is, I'm not an expert, so I might be getting some of it right. Mm-hmm. But from what I've done research-wise, there's three things in ayahuasca. There's two different types of tree bark, mm-hmm. and there's a thing called DMT yeah, yeah. that's inside it. They brew it up into this pot, and it's just, it's like an oil, and you take a wee tiny shot glass here. No, they take us down to a hut. Everyone's there in a circle. Mm-hmm. No, it's some serious, serious business, man. Like, people are there that there was a there was a woman there that who's had like a victim of sexual abuse and stuff and um, there was a guy there who had aids an older guy so that made me think it broke my ego to think who who am i to sit here i mean I, obviously everybody's got problems but see when you're sitting between people with massive problems I, it made me it made me think do you know what I think I might be depressed and sometimes I don't like my life. And then it made me realise that my life is actually amazing. Mm-hmm. It's just how I how approach it. How you frame it. it in your mind, mate. Yeah. Everything's how you look at it. So I went over there thinking I had problems and then I took ayahuasca and it made me realise that I didn't have problems. Mm-hmm. And wow, man. But it was so, so intense. It was ter- It was scary. I'm not even going to lie. Like, it was, it was yeah, scary. It's, it's something you feel creeping up and then you... I see that puking behind a curtain thing. That's just madness. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I totally understand though. You know, you can feel that. Like, yeah, you drink it right, and it hands down, it is the most vile thing I've ever tasted in my life. It's so disgusting that see when you get a day off, that entire day is well, you spent can taste. dreading drinking it again because it's so disgusting. It tasted like a, a former kind of. It was like drinking oil 
with licorice in it, mm-hmm. and it makes you instantly gag. And it was just, I mean, towards the end, I was like, I don't want to take it anymore because it was just so vile, but it makes you purge as well. Because uh, I never had anything in my body. It was just, it's supposed to cleanse you, uh, any stress and all that kind of stuff, and anxiety, and it's quite weird. And I don't, I mean, to sound like a psychopath when I'm saying this, but see, when I was, they give you a purge bucket, it's like a wee tiny bucket, and you're just spent four hours purging into this bucket and you can feel anxiety I could actually feel anxiety coming at you depression self-doubt hatred all coming uh, out coming out into this bucket and it was scary as mm-hmm. well because see when I could hear other people purging there was this wee Jewish guy called David from America We tiny guy and I actually got on with him really well to, we became mates because he was the only English speaking guy, everybody else never spoke English. I could hear him purge and it genuinely sounded like evil was coming at his body. It did not sound human. And what's what kind of scared me was that everyone in this circle was having the same trip. Mm-hmm. It was the same experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just mental, man. It was just mental. What a life changing thing happened, man. What the fuck? It's I don't know what you're thinking of, man. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. I would say look into it. And uh, it's just mental. It's just, it was showing me things in my life. It was showing me how, like, I was, how I acted. So say there was an instance when I was a bad person to you during what, my life, right? Which has luckily never been yet. Which has never been. But it showed me. What you were like. It showed me being a bad person to you from your point of view. So I was having a weird outer body experience. <clears throat> so I felt like I was you looking at me and I could feel your emotions. Like, I can't believe Dan said that to me. I can't believe he'd done that he to me. He made me feel that way. I, so I was getting it with times with my mum and dad. So I was like, straight away when I came out, I was like, I need to be a better son. Mm-hmm. I need to be a better person. I need to be a better brother. And it was just, and then it was shown as two different roads as well. Like if you continue to be like a negative person, you end up like this. You need to look after yourself physically with my weight and stuff. Which, which me, which I never really cared about. But when you're sitting in the jungle and you get a a change like that, I was like, God, man, I better start looking after myself. And that's kind of small changes to my life when I've came back. It's just mental, man. This is profound, man. Mm. You know, this is amazing. Sorry to freak anybody out. No, not at all, not at all. Self doubt certainly a massive thing. It affects me a lot of the time, man. Like that's that's big yeah. for me. You know, self doubt, and I think, I think that's just natural, art- isn't art- it? Artistic minds and brains, I think, suffer from it quite heavily. When yeah. you're putting yourself on the line, you're putting yourself out there. Um, aye, aye. You know, it is musically or comedy. Are people going to like this? Why should they like this? Yeah. You know, and or who do I think I am putting this video out? You know, I do, do, do people are going to think I'm too. You know, think I'm this and that. But the amazing thing is, is listening to a story like that, or us even chatting, is inspiring to yeah. upcoming actors or it's inspiring to us artists that are like, you know what, man? People do feel these doubts and they're normal. Yeah, like actually feeling down is fine. Do you know it what totally I mean? Is. It's like, a you, know, it's, it's, you, you don't yep. really under, no, you can't really experience the the highs of life without feeling what yeah. it's like to be exactly. at the bottom. And of having time, an so experience like that that's kind of shattering all of it and saying, Do you know what, mate, see the problems you think you have, mm-hmm. they're not really problems. No. It's how you're looking at them that's making them problems. Yeah. And that's man, wow. And you know, it's it's done a lot of things. It's you know, made man. you're talking about the self doubt thing because mm-hmm. sometimes you're, I was like, ah, am I a bad person? I think I might be a bad person for no reason. There's no. I think we all think I, that at times. So there's one thing that made me realise is I'm not a bad person, and it also made me realise that see the acting and the comedy, comedy and stuff, it doesn't mean anything. Family, self care, and health are number one, mm-hmm. and all that stuff is a bonus. But see before. Like, I'd be like, I've, I've never really been like that way, people anyway, but if somebody got an acting gig, you'd be like, how come he got that and I didn't get that? So it's mm. completely shattered all that stuff. Ego, basically. It's, it's totally crushed it. So see if somebody gets an acting gig and I don't get it. That I never even went for the gig, but people are still like, how come I never got that? I'm happy for that person now. Yeah, that's the way you need to be. Rather than being 
gutted or jealous, mm-hmm. which I wasn't really like anyway. But even more so now, you're not again, and because I, I I feel that way, not a very jealous type. But there are there's always instances, you know what I mean? What about the whole karma side of stuff? What made you think that karma and the whole life after death? What what was it? Just things you seen while you were under the influence? Was it just you know what I mean? I I mean it was like. Uh, I mean, there was one time I was taking it and it was completely, when I when I let myself go and I was like, do you know what, I'm just going to let let go and let this, because they call it a medicine. So I'll let it take control. Yeah, I was like, do you know what, I'm going to go from their angle and I'm going to act like it's a medicine and I just let go and at one point, you know, you're purging, it's a complete outer body experience. And at one point, I was scared. I was like, Am I going to die? Basically, mate, I was like, Am I going to die? In uh, the jungle. All, all these thoughts that were going through my head like, if I die, I'm dying in the middle of the Peru. I don't they really don't have know. life insurance. How are they going to get my body back to Glasgow? Uh, how are they going to get my body back up the river to where we were living in Peru. And then, I know it's quite comical, but I was like, ah, I'm dead fat, man. They're not going to be able to carry my body down the hull, put the body into a boat. Because the guys that stay in Peru and the guys that were working in the camp were all in their 70s. They they were even looking at me like, they've never seen a fat guy in their life, right? And I was 20-odd stone, so they looked at us like I was an alien. So that's all the stuff mm-hmm. that was going through my head. and But... It's so weird because see when it gets to a scary, a scary part when you're like, I think I'm gonna die. There is there was an experience I had when it was like a sha- a shaman or a being or something mm-hmm. kind of guided me through it. Mm-hmm. So see when I was purging, it, it felt like I had these I don't know what it was beings or something mm-hmm. run about me. I could feel like a female uh, was near me and. That's what they say. She Lady was, Ayahuasca. Lady Ayahuasca, that's it. A bit, that's... It was like a green, a green female that was, she had her, <laughs> aye, she had her hand, like her palm at the bottom of my back and she would do that right up my spine and see every time she'd done that, I purged. Mm-hmm. But, but you were letting out the shite? Yeah. Oh my and God. And it was like, I'm getting she, she was helping me do mm-hmm. it though. And it was just like, don't worry, you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, I felt. It's got to be something in that, man. I, uh, of course. I, it was just like, I don't even know. I mean, how these people have been doing it for thousands of years. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They, they, back, you know. they have a, uh-huh. an understanding of life that we will never understand and vice versa. Like We have a, a reality that they cannot understand mm-hmm. where they would be like, why would you want to live with a phone and... Like, you yeah. know, why, you know, they're like that. And we're the other side, like, how could you possibly live without all the information? And if a world leader died and I didn't know, you know, like, I need to yeah. know all that. It's such a wow, man, you know, because as you say, you, you, you're you coming from this society into that. They hardly speak the lingo. Yeah. You're f- so foreign to them. You're yeah. in the middle of the jungle, the heat. There's so many variables to then come back into this. It must be, it must be groundbreaking for you, mate. Uh, I mean, it was. I'm glad I did it because it just. I felt like a for for the first time in my life. I felt like a for, foreigner, and even though, see the guy that brought me my dinner every day, he was an old guy, probably nearly eighty, uh, fit as a fiddle, still working away. I didn't speak English, but towards the end we could communicate. Can- to each other I had about 500 cigarettes that I bought for the market that I, I smoked I didn't inhale but it kept the the beasties away at night and uh, I used to give him cigarettes and to what, when I wasn't eating he was giving me coconuts and stuff and it really did break down like Ra- that, racial barriers it and broke all this it down. see religion skin colour all that kind of stuff meaningless really it does not mean anything mm-hmm. and it was so strange because to what Towards the end, all these people that didn't speak English, we were we're all best friends. We were all best friends. We were all communicating, and you just realise what life should be like and how unimportant all this shit is about football and religion and all that. I mean, Mm. there's nothing wrong with religion, but I think man, I mean, how am I going (laughs) to? Religion's no broke. Man is broke. Ah, Do you know what I mean? Totally. So. Totally. 
But it was, it was, and then I had to come back and I, I rewrote my Glasgow show over there. I sat in my wee hut and I, I wrote the entire show and I came back and then within four days I'd done my Glasgow Comedy Festival show and I'd done it for the first time because I never had a chance to do the new material and it done really well. Mm -hmm. And it was more of a, I cannot believe that just happened to my life. And, mm -hmm. You know, I went through. But do you think it went so well because you had unshackled the chains and you were like, look, I'm kind of like what you did with that, um, the audition. It's like, I'm just going in here to have some fun. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they don't like it because no one's going to die. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's like nothing, you know, as you're saying, all these things don't actually really mean anything. Yeah. It's down to your own contentment and treating the people around you right. Oh, it's, I... it's the exact way I woke up this morning, wasn't it? And I sent you that message. Because like, yeah. it was actually Gavin yeah. Oates who brought us all together through the, the thing at the Hydro. He had shared something. He was like, before you kick off your Monday properly, read this article. So I was like, okay. Yeah. Right, Gavin's saying it. I'll read it. And it was all about this girl that died young and she'd left like a long letter of her last sort of admission of what she wanted to talk about in life. And it's all about how, man, we all stress out about really menial things, man, when it's like, you know, you Aye. need to just cherish the, the moments. And I, I get that vibe from Gavin. I, I wouldn't be, I don't think he has, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's took it because I just get a different energy for that guy. Mm -hmm. And it's a nice energy as well. It's a really nice energy. Uh -huh. Great guy, man. So uh, it's left what, me what, speechless. Uh, what he accomplished with that, show that hydro thing that he put together was just that shows you where his energy's at yeah connecting all those people yeah. from all those different industries and yeah. giving yeah. us that all platform for or... the greater good oh that was unbelievable and he used to be a stand-up comedian by the way he was yeah, funny yeah. yeah yeah he's a very funny the uh, color ham I yeah swear to the color ham I, I i started doing it when they were just finishing but they were going to be the next big thing, man. He, he's got funny bones. Mm. And it's so surreal to see that uh, change in him. Mm. Uh, but how did you feel? It was amazing seeing you uh, day a gig at the Hydro, especially with the two youngsters. Two girls, aye. Well, it was brilliant, man. I know. It felt brilliant to, I guess, get the, get the youngsters involved, put them at the centre stage and have them uh, DJing to to 10,000 people in Scotland's best venue. You know, so amazing. So I, it was surreal. We were just chatting about that before. Like, you know, when you look at Still Game and when that all get announced, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the live shows, you know, I was nervous for them. Like, man, that must be so different from TV. Oh, man. To, to try and articulate and make people laugh mm -hmm. from what you're used to doing in TV. It must be a totally different... To wrap your head around that, you probably yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. have a good opinion on that kind of thing but even looking at that and then going and doing it ourselves being backstage meeting all the other people that are going on everyone's just walking about looking at each other like yeah. are we actually about to do this I think that was the, the, the major thing for me as well is like I's known the greats that have been in there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like then to be to be part of something for me what I kept telling the, the girls as well was like look this is going to seem like a while till the build up right but I was like this is going to go so so quickly Mm -hmm. the, the next thing you know it'll be two weeks gone by yeah. right and now look I mean we're already a couple of months gone by nearly yeah. so it's like um, it is it's just that you've got to just take those moments I mean even the day before the sound check I was just really trying to soak all in walking about the yeah. stage like oh my god this is something I've always wanted Aye. to do and that's mm -hmm. saying if I can crack a joke make the crowd laugh dream come true do you know what I mean it's like and we had that opportunity Aye. to do that mate mm. I mean and that's why I like you so much as well because like uh, when I turned up that day everybody was just in the same boat and I think the lassies were like ah, no way there's that guy for Scott Squad but we were equally just so is this actually happening yeah, and yeah. we were so I remember just standing at the side with my my cult and you were like so nice to us and I was like ah, that guy's a good guy man mm. do you know what I mean and uh, I think uh, it's the kind of same vibe I get off of Gavin mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was an unbelievable day. I kind of regret not enjoying it, enjoying it as much. I think I had some form of blackout, like a, a nerve blackout or something. I don't mm -hmm. know. I was mm -hmm. just... You weren't truly yourself. I, I was just like, did that... When I was on stage, I had a weird, like... <laughs> Out of I, body. I felt like I was watching myself. Aye. Do you know what and I mean? That's so strange and... It's a very small amount of people and that get to do something like that, you know, or to go into a stage that size and have that many people watching. And that's what kind of was going through my head. And I'm like, I feel like I'm outside of yeah. my body. So here, privileged you know, to and, do this. Yeah. 
and uh, we were obviously running through what we were saying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I know, good, man. And like, we had it all kind of dialed in. And then there was a couple of times we were running through where we were like, stuck on bits and all that. Oh, and like, we just need to trust that it's all going to flow. Because it's a be different fine. level of nerves, isn't it? It's a, it's a, because I sweated right through that black coat. I've never sweated like that before. It was a different kind of sweat. We kept drinking water, man. We must have panned about four litres of water, mate. I and never went to the toilet. Didn't go to the toilet. Wow, man. So there's, there was something going on, mate. It was like, I don't know what that was all about. It got absorbed into your kill, from, from, <laughs> <laughs> from the morning, though. We must have panned two bottles in the morning. And then another hour, another bottle, another, maybe a bottle of a half hour or an hour, didn't go to the toilet, neither, neither of us. Mate, literally That's about three, four litres of water. What's wow. going on there, you know? Just, just all the adrenaline coming out and the walls just facilitating. No, do you know what I mean? I don't know, man. Pure adrenaline. Pure adrenaline, man. Aye. Aye walking, was. walking up those stairs. Yeah. Through the black thing. And then the phone lights being on and all that. The oh. Britney mic and all that. No, oh. I, mean, I just wanted a red leotard. <laughs> You'd have been set. <laughs> Shout toxic. <laughs> you did jump on like Britney. I was like, <laughs> I did, I did, see, for such a well built guy, I was like, he's got twinkle toes. Man. Around. Oh, mate, I've got him moves, mate. I've got him. Not exactly. But again, a big part for us the whole time, and you know, it certainly was like, ah, look, man, can we just go out and have fun, man? Yeah. Let's not look at this too seriously, mm. do you know? Because mm. if we go down too serious, it's like you're going to freak yourself out. Plus, it's all young people. And, and that's, I actually remember saying that to you when you were kind of freaking out, and then the birds came over and they're like, oh, I wish oh, I, I would never, wouldn't want that to be me, you know, because you were saying you didn't have anything prepped. And, that, and what I said to you, and I remember, was that, like, mate, at the end of the day, you've been on the telly. You've yeah. got so much to give these young people. Mm -hmm. So even if you're thinking, no, I'm no prepped lab, mate, I knew when I was 17, that's why I went into the job centre asking, can I get a job on telly or a TV presenter? And she started laughing at it, you know what I mean? And I ended up Morrison's. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it was just like one of the exact ones where I was like, man, you're going to go out there and you could have said anything and I'd have been like, I want to go and meet that guy because mm -hmm. I want to be on the telly. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter. You had so much value in what you brought me and it, you that, brought the host in. I, I, I totally, man. You know, and I've got to back that up, you know, it was brilliant sitting sitting watching it you know uh, it was great and, and that's what Claire had said to me as well to calm me down because I was kind of freaking out yeah, exactly. like, you owe it to them oh, totally calm down you know and I'm like that's you know kind they deserve to hear this because it will help them because they are it's, it's not about mm -hmm. really us here it, no. it's, it's about like you know giving yeah. Them those we see. We've been those really wee guys. We've aye. been them. And aye. you've then DJed in some of the best stages. Yeah, I mean, really, that is that's a massive thing yeah. in itself. I mean, have you done gigs that are not uh, I take it you've done a gig to um, not twelve thousand people, but I know thousands of people. Thousands of people. Everton, amnesia aye. and Ibiza and Amnesia I, Ibiza was I've done that five times and that's right up there with the, the hydro. That's, that's again totally surreal, you know, you're kicking about backstage with the best and one of the best nightclubs there is. Same time, I think what's important for the young people and that to realise is that all of us and it, your, yourselves, you know, has played to rooms of nobody as well. Oh, fine. You aye. know, pub, and that's pubs the, and Clyde Bank that, and all that. You know, my, my first few, I mean, not my first few gigs, even recent gigs sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got to do it. It's, yeah. it's, it comes with the territory. I, I I try not to be too harsh, but see if someone approaches me and all they're doing is talking about oh Frankie Boyle and Kevin Bridges. I'm like, that's no stand up comedy. Mm -hmm. Like stand up comedy is it's the gritting, aye, gritting, gritting. It's doing a gig in Airdrie on a Wednesday night to fourteen people that don't want to listen to you. Mm -hmm. That's stand up comedy. That's sticking not, in your skin. Aye, it's no I'm not saying it's a bad industry, it's a beautiful industry. And Boyle and Bridges have sweated blood to get where mm -hmm. they are. Absolutely. But, that is no the circuit. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a stand-up comedian, it's hard hard work. Mm -hmm. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I earn a living, and people are like, "Ah, oh, but would it no be good if you go on that?" And I'm like, "Aye, but when's that ever going to stop? It's mm -hmm. nothing's ever good enough." Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm quite happy with what I've got. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a brilliant lesson in that. Well, you've you've got an agent at the moment, don't you? Yeah, I've got an agent. I've had an agent for a couple of years. Uh, How's that been going? Good. Yeah, she's she's lovely. It's a, I've got a great support network behind me. Um, you know, I'm, I don't mean to shoot. I'm not downing myself, but I was a trolley boy for ten years. Do you know what I mean? I was in the red group in school. Mm -hmm. I never done. I, I remember I just got up in school one day and I just left. I was like, I don't want to go to school anymore. I never done my standard. I never studied for my standard grades. So you just left. I yeah. I just left. <laughs> got a job in Safeway, and then 
stayed there until it was Morrison's. Mm -hmm. And then, so see when it comes to like uh, trying to get a gig or all that work, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what that is. So it's good. That's what an agent's for. And that's good that she deals with that side. And I just deal with the walk the onto the stage side. That mm -hmm. I, Wow, so for the for for trolley and eh, man, like to, to get into the tail in that again is such a such an inspiring story, mate, oh, because man. amazing. You no know, people are out there saying, I yeah, what you know, what are you gonna do? You're just being a trolley boy and, that. and it's like, Well, I'm gonna show you, do you know what I mean? Through Aye. my actions, you know what I mean? And I did have that. I did have of course you it's, did. it's so strange as well because even though I was like that, I, I just had an inner belief, like, I know this is gonna harm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No I deluded. Uh, mm -hmm. thing but it was just like I know if I put the work in it's going to happen mm -hmm. and I had a goal uh, I feel kind of I don't know embarrassed but I remember being younger and I was like if I'm not on a TV show before I'm 30 I'm going to chuck it and I got it do you know what I mean but the, the belief of that happening was so strong. it wasn't it, it, I, it was so strong that it just happened through hard work mm -hmm. It's so, important, that? it's so important to have set goals out there. Gives your life meaning and purpose as well to, to work towards something, yeah. do you know what I mean? And even my mentality towards uh, work, working as a trolley boy for so long, I kind of, instead of thinking, oh, what did I do for 10 years? Wasted my life for 10 years. I just think, do you know what? I enjoyed that. I needed that. Mm. I needed that in my life. I need you. that. Uh, you know what? Ground, I, grounded you. Grounded me. I hope I don't have an ego, but it's kept, see all that stuff? It's... Uh, all that stuff is totally gone, man. We working as a trolley boy for ten years. That's inspiring, man. It's great. It's it's going to be great for for people watching this. Definitely I'm blown away. There was something Kevin Bridges said too, wasn't there? About a wee bit of advice he gave you to just go for it. Hi, I remember sitting. I don't know if I was having a beer or a coffee with him or something, but I remember uh, I got a gig with him and Frankie Boyo at the stand and I was the middle act and he was the compere. And I had a pull of sickie for Asda that day and I was just so caught up in, oh, I might get the sack and all that kind of stuff. And he just done that to you after your nut. He's like, you're funny enough. You're funny. You're a comedian. And I just had this feeling of, aye, I'm a comedian. And that was in the Sunday and I think, I, I don't know if it was the next day. It probably was the next day. I just went into work and I was like, yeah, I quit. And they were totally like, what? And I was like, I quit. I but we need you. And I was like, no, you don't. I was like, I've been to the finals, uh, com uh, Scottish Comedian of the Year. I've been to the Le Leicester Mercury Comedian nominee. I've been to the So You Think You're Funny final. All these finals at Peter Kay and Bridges and all that, Jimmy Carr have been to. And I remember being so stressed with work. that They, they never gave me the nights off. See the stress that that caused me? They never showed me any support. They never said, you know what, you're trying a bit of your life. Mm. Let's just swap your shift. And I kind of said that to them and they're like, what are you going to do? I'm going to be a stand-up comedian. And they just looked at me like I was mental. Yeah. Uh, and I, d I did it. I, d I went and did it. It wasn't pure. I, ne I need to tell people that I, n I never went to earn a living straight away. There was a few things I went to do. I worked with my pal uh, washing Wendy's for a wee while. Uh, I worked with a joiner, Dean Kitchens. And then I get now. You just done it to aye, get by, basically. to get by. But that was good as well. I needed that as well because it's desperation as well mm -hmm. makes you perform. I wrote, some of my, I wrote some of the best jokes in my life when I was working in Asda. I think it's because you've got that. You, you've got the material. Aye. Or that just, I need to get out of here. Like it makes the you drive. better. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes I miss that as well. Mm -hmm. I, I worked, I've done a couple of shifts with my pal last year, uh, washing Wendy's and... Uh, just to help him because he runs a business with his da and his da done his back and he fell off a one up basically fell off a windy <laughs> so I went and helped him and I was literally washing the windies of these people and our, our old woman was like ah, are you in that squad squad 
I was like, aye, help my pal, take that shift. That's brilliant though, man. Uh, it keeps you, keeps you grounded, mate. Aye. You've got to do what you need to do. You really do. You know? I think a lot of the young ones don't realise that now. Do you know what I mean? They're uh, like, I'm not yeah. going to go for that job. I don't want that job. And it's aye. like, aye, but you need experience in something. You need to earn a bit yeah. of money. I want. No matter I'm not going to be a barman. I'm not doing that. Aye. It's kind of like, well, why not? Now, we even turn our nose up at gigs now as well. I'm sure you get it with the DJs and stuff. Mm. Well, I'm not gigging there. I'm not mm. doing that venue. I'm not doing that pub. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that goes for all different angles. Even yeah. actors are like, oh, I would never go on Scott Squad yeah. or River City or yeah, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. But we're all in the same boat, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the creative industries in general. Aye. I think, you know, you're, you're going to get a bit of snobbery yeah. in that way, especially if, if one's trying to get through. Or maybe they've tasted something mm-hmm. before. Like, for example, at the Hydro. You could be like, well, you know, oh, well, I'm not doing that now or whatever. And it's like, no, that is, that's not how it works. You've, you've got to go and do yeah. the pubs and the back rooms and the... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now, there was something there, just, just to come off topic, right? Um, I hope I'm talking all right, by the way. I'm not giving great, a lot of shit. Right? Sounding great. Yeah, See, that, this is that, genuinely, like, I'm really, really um, I'm enjoying really, this really one. I'm really enjoying it. Oh, thank uh, you. To be honest, like, we Excellent. were like, right, we'll do it for an hour, because we're like, we're probably going to go way over an hour, but just because it is good and I'll the be best ones. Minute. Yeah, go for it, go for it. One of the ones, Ooh. right... I'm essentially well, we're sat here with a terrorist. Is, is that is that is that accurate? Is that accurate? Right? <laughs> a very sound terrorist that's uh, got no religious views. But no, basically there was a story that came out a few years ago, hilarious, where you got into a bit of trouble at Glasgow Airport. Oh so tell us about what happened, and uh, do we need to be worried? Well, first of all, <laughs> let me ask you: Do you remember when that story came out? No, 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 I di- no, I didn't. No. So, w- did you just find out about it through my Twitter? It's or? just just through me researching bits and bobs <laughs> about you because obviously I like to, to extensively research yes. all guests before they come on. Sometimes it's last minute, other times it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's full on. But that was something I dread like the last week or something. So I just typed into Google as you can do now. Yeah. See what comes up, what nonsense might come up, and that was one of them. And it was a day that record headline um, <laughs> Darren Corr of Scott Squad's, uh, Squad's <laughs> star uh, is like gets in trouble at Glasgow Airport yeah. so I was like right, what's this juicy story so <sighs> it's such a it was so unlucky I mean it's going to take about five minutes for me to describe right it was such an unlucky chain of events that it can be it can only be funny do you know what I mean oh it's, it's, it's amazing man basically I mean I feel very lucky uh because I never had a criminal record. I haven't got one, but there was so much that went in my favour. Like, they knew what I was like as a person. The fact that I was on a TV show. I mean, basically, I bought it for a pro... The the, the actual thing is, I bought it for Scott Squad uh, because Scott Squad's partly improv. We come up with our own storylines. Yeah. And it was knuckle dusters it you was, had, wasn't it? It was a knuckle duster I bought yeah. because there was a storyline in Scott Squad when I ran into the station with a bag of knives and I was like, I found these knives and it turns out it was jugglers' knives. So I was like, oh, I might get the knuckle duster and run into the station and say that it was my granda's ring because you get the old-fashioned sovereign rings. Yeah, that So I'd be attached. like, oh, this is a sovereign ring, and Officer Karen would be like, no, that's a deadly weapon. And I was like, no, it's no, it's my granddaughter's ring. <laughs> no, no, that funny in the bigger picture rings, but basically I went to Bulgaria with my pal a couple of years ago. I don't know if you've ever, you ever been to Bulgaria. No. Right, so see knuckle dusters and all that kind of stuff. It's all legal there. So you walk up this beach, there's like a three-mile length a stretch a beach all these stalls selling stuff aye, mad random yeah i like gas masks and all that and it's when i still drank so i was just like it's legal in bulgaria so my stupid i think i was just childlike thinking like oh i could buy it and just take it back so but this is when i get really stupid right i bought the knuckle duster i says that to my pal i'm going to use that for scott squad i left it in my suitcase right I got back to Glasgow. I completely left it in my suitcase. Four months later, my pal is having a stag do in Germany and I get invited to that. With that still in there, forgetting. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I just ditched the suitcase in my room, never even unpacked it, right? The Bulgaria stickers still on the case. I'd done a gig at the Hydro for ICW, Insane Championship Mm -hmm. Wrestling. Uh, Bobby runs out, he ran out for the crowd. Uh, 
<laughs> Come on. A wrestler pulled me for the crowd, right? <laughs> as part of the storyline. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was supposed to cushion my blow. I didn't cushion it and I broke my ribs. And it was just like a mental wrestling show. There was free drink there, right? I was drinking Jack D for the bottle and all that. They are nuts though, they shows. I, they were absolutely men. It was like Mark Dallas was like, we can't pay you, but you're getting a gig. At, it wasn't the Hydro, it was the SEC. You're getting a gig at the SEC and I've always loved wrestling. So I was like, aye, I'll do it. He's like, don't worry, there'll be free drink there. I turn up to the SEC, right? Have you, have you ever been in Costco? It was like a 10-litre bottle of Jack tea. No juice, no cups, no ice, no beer or nothing. And he's like, ah, that's the free bevy. And I don't know, mate, is there no mixers and all that? <laughs> he's like, ah, no, all the wrestlers have all tanned it. And I was like, so we've basically got a 10-litre bottle of Jack D. And all the actors were like, ah, we can't drink that. And I was like, I'm fucking drinking that. So basically tanning Jack D for the bottle. Get steaming, pulled his other barrier, broke my ribs. I had to go up to Stilt Hall, try trying to stop Hall Hospital and do that to a doctor. I'm a comedian, right? And I was in a wrestling show and my, ri <laughs> my ribs get broke. You get any tramadol? Tramadol? No, I'm in a wrestling with Hulk Hogan and all that. <laughs> so, and then on top of that, oh my, my pal was like, ah, are you ready to go to my stag do? So I ran back to my house. Risk with broken ribs. Yes, put my nut on medication as well. Still drink, still drunk as well. I'm not uh, proud of that. And left for Glasgow Airport at five in the morning. Grabbed a suitcase, and it was just a chain of events mm -hmm. that were just. It started off where the suitcase was. It was handheld luggage, and I've got a massive suitcase about that size. I'm trying to get through handheld luggage. Uh, I've got these broken ribs. I put my nut on medication. And they were we were going through the the barriers, and all, and then I noticed there's like ten staff members in my suitcase, and I stupidly <laughs> I done that. Is it cause I've got shampoo? <laughs> and they were like, ah, they just looked at me like I was a maniac. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, shampoo. I, I thought it because uh, you get cause the wee, liquid the eye. <laughs> And Some knockers, you've got a knuckle they, they pull out the knuckle duster and see that feeling of utter doom. Mm -hmm. It was just like I completely forgot it was in there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pure and darkness. It was just darkness, man. I was so embarrassed. I was in ashamed of myself. These two polis took us into this room, and I was just pure. It was. It was like, <laughs> are you going to put your fingers up my ass, mate? Uh, Jesus. And it was just like, what? What are you doing? And I was mm. just like, I was done a wrestling show at that, the SEC last night and I've got broken ribs and I'm showing them the medication that I was on. And then the police, I was like, I'm in a show called Scott Squad and they were they were kind, they were so kind. Mm -hmm. But see, because of the, I suppose you just need to go through these things. They tried to put, it wasn't a terrorist thing, but it was because it was the airport, it was like a terrorism charge and then carrying a deadly weapon. But... I just had to support a Scott squad and saying that's a prop and mm -hmm. all that stuff and aye, I got away with it. So uh, must have been scary. It took a long time to get away with it, you know, all these unnecessary court things and but that's that's how it happens and I remember people laughing in court and stuff. It was just weird and I'm sitting in court and people were laughing and police are laughing and all that and I was just like, why why is this happening? And people are like, yeah, that's that guy for Scott Squad and People are getting parking fines and it was just so, I felt like it was so unnecessary, even though I did make a mistake, but I, it was, uh, it gave us a major reality check as well, uh, that I just, you know. That's mad. I can't believe you broke your ribs. I know, I, man. I know, man. That's, that's, I've, that's I've, mental. I've been a massive fan of wrestling though, as well. You know, oh, to, to be invited how was to that, or whatever that That was, uh, see, that night, See, when I broke my ribs, I never even felt it, but we were backstage after it, and I was like, I was just like, ah, I don't, I think I'm like, I've got stress. Have you ever had like a stress knot? Like, knots? Right, and I know what you mean, right? I was like, I think I've got knots. And the BBC press officer, I was like, I feel that there. And she was like, ah, into my ribs, and she's like, ah, wow, 
that's a, that's a stress knot you've got. And I was like, you know how sometimes you can massage it out? Oh, man. And I was like, can you massage that out? And she was just like, right into my rib. And I was like, ah. Oh. I was like, ah, that's not going away. And it wasn't until I woke up the next day, I took my tap off and my entire right side was just jet black. And I was, was like, it? all right, that's that's uh, more than that's a wee stress Jesus knot. Christ. But you know what? The, the night was amazing. Uh, the wrestlers are so talented. The crowd was amazing, and it was just great to be a part of it. The crowd love it. Oh, <laughs> they're so into it. Aye, it was. I mean, I loved when I'm the same as you. I loved wrestling mm -hmm. as well when I was younger, mm. and that was a big, big thing for me. That was a massive, a thing. proud moment, man. How did the, and how did the break happen? You said you had to try and take an impact, but you done it wrong or something. Uh, I mean, I never really done it wrong. I was just dead weight. I mean, the pilt is at a barrier, and I land on the concrete. But because I was dead weight, I think see the thing holding the barrier up as well. There was a wee like pole or something, and I just hit off the pole. But again, I was you know a big guy, steaming, no, no physically fit, steaming, and I just the side to me hit half this pole and it was just uh, made a jelly man and but it must have looked good <laughs> it was good I mean it was a good the next day I was like ah, yes I broke my ribs wrestling it was quite uh, uh, quite a proud moment aye, mm. but I, Steve I, Austin I but that's that never it, it never actually affected me I didn't care I was like it's a wrestling show mm -hmm. these things happen I mean I shouldn't have drank five litres of Jack D that didn't help but <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, that must have been. But that's all those guys are. are you you uh, need to get a couple of drinks, remember, man. Remember a few years ago, I was trying to get you to be a wrestler. Aye. I was like coming up with names and all that. Aye, aye. I was like, right, no. <laughs> like, you big guy, you big guy. You're great at it and all that. And then I, re I realised that you kind of take being prodded in the. No, the, no. Like, freaks no, him no. out. Do you know what I mean? He's like, so. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I hate getting hit in the stomach or that. You know what I mean? It's just I'm not that. I'm not going to last all, so. <laughs> so that's your weak spot <laughs> till it's abs again you know <laughs> a um, slap to the belly <laughs> no but it was good but uh, so one of the things we did uh, do posting about this podcast today right we asked for a couple of questions for the crowd so I've got a couple um, one of which was a wee guy called Ollie McKenzie great wee guy so he was asking um, what was your favourite part about being on Scott Squad being on Scott Squad well first of all hello Ollie Thank you very much for your question. Uh, my favourite part about being on it was uh, what, what does he mean? Just like my just what was your what was your favourite thing favorite about the show? Favourite moment yeah. on, on doing the show or oh, sketch or yeah, something. Yeah, what was just your favourite thing about being a part of it? Do you know what I mean? What was your your takeaway well, thing? My favourite sketch that I was involved in was uh, a one a tour of the jail, and Officer Karen takes us about the jail, and then she locked me in. The cell. cell, and I, I kind of shouted stuff for the cell, and I remember thinking that was good fun, man. Aye. Uh, I was talking about give me a spoon and I'll dig myself out like uh, Shawshank Redemption Aye. and all that. Uh, the teddy bear, there was one I got a paint my face painted into a teddy bear, and it's just pure silliness. I remember that, like trying to play it straight. Do you know what I mean? Uh, that they are my favourite sketches. I love the camaraderie of it. I love the kind of up at seven in the morning and make up for eight on set for nine you're filming to seven i love that intensity mm -hmm. i love the kind of this is kind of improv as well so it could be bad you know you're kind of scared it that it's going to be way. really bad but I, I i just love the and then i love watching things that i don't know anything about i don't know anything about cameras and all that stuff so it's it's nice to kind of see learn how it works i like look at that amazing bit of machinery that that guy's got attached to shudder mm -hmm. that's probably worth 30 grand mm -hmm. and it's just nice to see all that stuff as well that's pretty cool right another one was uh, from ross clement uh, who was asking is that wolf print jumper your own <laughs> <laughs> i wish it was it's unbelievably comfy yeah. uh, it costs a lot of money as well by the way you can get them for america and i think they're like a hundred pounds uh but it's not mine now the the bobby loves animals and that's how that part of the character but uh, it's an amazing costume to wear it's really comfy everybody's dressed up as a polis and stuff and I'm just like I feel like I'm cutting a bit in my pyjamas mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with the wolf t-shirts and all that they're good as well that's amazing it's that's... not that far off Bobby there's no much difference 
between Bobby and me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just exaggerated. <laughs> Aye, as you'll see in for this. And and a series five coming soon as well, you're saying as well. Aye, series five is coming back. I think it's gonna be part of the new channel. I'm not one hundred percent sure. Um That's cool. I don't know if it's probably won't be on this year, but it might be January or February. Amazing. But that's all I know. So what would what would be, I suppose, for kind of on the wind down now, what would be advice for young people looking to get into TV or the creative industries or comedy? What would be your sort of your golden nuggets of wisdom from your experiences to, to get people on the ladder or getting involved? Get involved, I would say you need to show the industry respect. If you don't show the industry respect, you won't get it back. Mm hmm that's and that's not even stand up that's music mm -hmm. and everything if you don't love this industry if you don't want to be part of it and do the right things to be a part of it then you're never going to get in mm -hmm. if somebody wants to be a stand up comedian uh, you need to go into stand up comedy clubs and watch live comedy you need to it's all fair and well quoting uh, Lee Evans jokes you need to go into the the trenches and get to the stand-up mm -hmm. comedy clubs, uh, the stand comedy club, uh, the state bar, yes bar, and watch working circuit comedians and watch how, I learn what an opener is, a compare, a main support, and watch these people in front of 20 people on a Tuesday night. And when you watch it and get enough under your belt and then you go and do five minutes, try and get five minutes somewhere, write five minutes of material and just go for it mm -hmm. and you know through that I, I mean I never knew how to get into acting but I was doing stand up comedy in a pub one night and that's how I got my Scott Squad edition Joe Hewlett walked up to us and says do you know I really like you as a stand up comedian I'd like to offer you an edition for the show that I'm working on and it, it was literally that mm -hmm. where, where's the where, where is it it's a comedy in it alright I've never heard it Friday no bother and it was that was it and that was me being in the circuit gigging every night turning up turning up aye and doing the gigs that nobody else was, nobody else wanted to do mm -hmm. do you know what I mean mm -hmm. amazing solid solid advice aye man. and that's it just you know you need to love it you need to love the game you need to I, I went to the stand comedy club every single night for maybe two or three years as a punter no, because I needed to. It's because I, I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Is this between when you were 18 and 24, before you got back on the ladder? Or is this the years before 24, before Aye. you step back on? You're like, do you know what? I need to break myself down, get a hang, and just see Aye. how everyone's doing it and yeah. get immersed in the culture. Because it was one of the ones. I studied television production and sound recording when I was 18. And it's because I wanted to be an actor. Mm -hmm. So I thought for some weird reason that that was going to make me an actor. I realised it wasn't, it, and I had no interest in the production side. I was the exact same. Me, I did the I did the same courses, college courses, and I I, I dropped out of two of my courses. Aye, because I was just like, this is not Where's the Aye. Where's the cameras and that man? Aye. <laughs> you know, you know Mate, I just want to have fun. You know what I mean? And that's what goes down to. We didn't know you can go and do drama. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, the guy in the class was like, ah, you should be a stand-up comedian. You're funny. Uh, go and try Red Raw at the stand. Mm -hmm. What's Red Raw? What's the stand? Turn up at the stand. They gave me five minutes. I've got nobody told me that you had to write jokes. I turn up. I go up for five minutes, and the term that we use in the stand-up circuit is dying in your ass, and that's what I done. I I went into that comedy club with no respect, thinking that I could just be funny. I was so nervous. I get paralytic drunk, and everything that an open spot shouldn't do, I done it. I took about 30 mates, I turned up a steaming, I didn't care about the comedians in the green room, and I went up and I made an arse of myself, and see that crushing mm -hmm. slap of a reality check that I got, I just done that, I need to get away for this, I, but in my head I was like, ah, I can't let that be my first and last time, I was so ashamed, because I love comedy, I was so ashamed that you I bombed so much. I or disrespected it so mm -hmm, much. Because mm -hmm. if somebody else done that, I'd be like, ah, look at the state of him. And then I'd done it. So I just, for, and my confidence was crushed as well. So for years, I just done that. I'm going to come back as a punter. I'm going to actually find out about Scottish comedy. 
and mm. it honestly took us to I was about 24 and then I done that do you know what I'm, I'm, I'm good to give this another go and if I'm bad then I'll know that I'm no funny it's mm -hmm. not because I was steaming or nervous and I get my second chance and I went up and they gave me five minutes. I never done five minutes. I done about three and a half minutes because I was so nervous. But I got about three applause breaks, and I remember thinking, "That's me. I'm hooked." I was like, "I've get, I've got something for that that I'm going to do my second gig that they gave me, and if I'm poor, I'll chuck it." And my second gig was like, I smashed it, and I just thought, "Aye, I'm I'm going to pursue this." Do you know what I mean? Nice. It's amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. It's amazing to hear. It really is. Yeah. Again, inspiring. You know, Cracking episode. Yeah, maybe my favourite. One of, man. Mm. You say that to all your guests. We do, I. We do. <laughs> it's not even recording. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, but it's, it, that has been good. But the thing is, the best podcasts are always the ones where we, well, I feel we could just go on. Yeah. And that's, I don't even know how long I've been going. No, it's been great. And that's, that, that is always the best ones, I think, where you just feel like, man, like a lot of the time when you end them, you're like, we could do that again. So that would be good if we end up coming over to you guys. So, aye, right, let's let's plug some of the stuff you've got coming up because we've obviously spoken so about the whole on, journey. What's going on then? What, what are the, the things that you want to mention and get all of our... And we'll include it everywhere course, we can. We'll put all the links in the descriptions. Well, if anybody actually wants to see me do stand-up comedy, I'm returning to the Glasgow Comedy Festival in March. The Glasgow International Comedy Festival. I'm doing the Stan Comedy Club, returning to where the where I done my first gig, and I'm doing an hour on Friday the 15th of March. And when you go to that, you're mm -hmm. more than welcome. I'll sort you out with tickets. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, it's who you know, it's who you know. Hi, I mean, I'm still twenty quid each. But, uh, <laughs> Excellent. No, uh, and the show's called Abandon All Hope. So, and I don't mean that to be uh, dark or anything. It's just because somebody's carved it into the wall in the backstage, and it's always stuck with me. Mm. And then I'm doing my, I'm bringing my podcast back for Glasgow Live. Amazing. Uh, Monday the 19th of November, which I'll get you on. Mm -hmm. Nice. And I'm doing Panto. What's nice. happened to the Panto? Because my mom's just went and bought some Panto for the 20th of December or something, and I'm hoping to God you're in it, but I don't know. No, well, she'll be Glasgow, won't she? I'm aye. doing it in Dundee. Right, aye, aye, aye. Uh, at the Garden Theatre at Cinderella, and I'm playing an ugly sister. So the 8th of December oh, to the 31st of December. December. I thought it might have been Cinderella. But <laughs> <laughs> right, excellent. So one of the ugly sisters. How, how are, you, are you enjoying the panto side of the world? Because that, that, that freaks me out, the pantomime stuff. I don't know. I've always yeah. felt weird about it. How, how, how do you? I mean, th th that's another thing. It's a run of strange events to get that. I essentially done it because my nephew told me to do it. He's, one's five years old and the other one's seven and they're at a stage that they still believe all that's mm -hmm. real and I just seen it was so buzzing and I was like do you know what I'd love to do a panto when I bring my family there to see that because I remember what how I felt when I was that age Aye. watching a panto and they couldn't come and see one of your normal stand ups uh, no, way, <laughs> no way and my mum and dad have never seen me do stand up and stuff because it is dark it is really dark and but that was an amazing thing for the family to come. I'd done my first panto last year at Dundee. I was like uh, Maleficent's daft son, right. Bobby, for legal reasons. It couldn't be Bobby. <laughs> uh, so, but it was the first time I've ever done that. I really struggled as well. See the addition, no, the addition, uh, the, oh, what's it called? Rehearsals. Aye. I really struggled with that because I never had a crowd to work off of. And it was the same way we were kind of reading stuff off a script. I'm like... Uh, this feels unnatural. I, I'm not going to lie, for the first three weeks, I was like, I've been found out here. Do you know what I mean? I feel like a fish out of the water. But see, as soon as I go in front of a crowd, I loved it, man. Uh, actors are a wee bit different. They need scripts and they need, they need to learn. And I'm like, just give me a crowd and I'll be all right with mm. that. Uh, but... I, I loved it. I've been lucky enough, Robert C. Kelly, a, a great guy, he's a producer. Uh, he's asked me back to go back as an ugly sister. I've never done that before either. I'm going to date with Tom Urie, my pal, and I'm looking forward to it. 
Amazing, it man. Sounds like a good laugh. Aye. Definitely. So is there any stuff this side of the year, stand, like uh, comedy gigs or that, or is it just ever kind of you're now, you're going to be next year when people can come see you? Aye, I mean, I start rehearsals for Panto in a couple of weeks now. So, so it's all Everything's about Panto. Okay, brilliant. So until season. the 31st of December, and then I start gigging again in January, February. So Amazing. Nice, man. Definitely but obviously, you know, Twitter you. and stuff and my Facebook for gigs and all that kind of stuff. Brilliant. So just add Darren Connell. 87. 87, that's it. Adam Connell, 87. Well, we'll put that, we'll put that in as well. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, Hopefully really. I've not gibbered too much. Mate, it's been amazing, honestly. I think, honestly. Uh, it'll go down well. It's great stories. We've went everywhere. I know, we're, man. We're like, that. could keep going, do you know what I mean? For a week, man, well, we've had Darren Connell on for amazing. episode 24. Really, really special episode. Nice, lovely guy, so thanks so much. And um, till next time, I yeah, guess. till next time, we will definitely do it again. Um, and when you get yours fired up, it'll be a pleasure. To we'll come into your territory, yeah. yes. These are more than welcome. Where are you going to be doing it from again? Glasgow Live, Glasgow Live's head office. Nice one, man. Nice. Which is, be big, I can't tell you where that is because we're the Illuminati, mate. <laughs> Aye, well, that's it, since you <laughs> that's unless that. you bring a goat to sacrifice, that's the only way you're getting in. Well, we'll 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 make sure we've got some goals on this. <laughs> yeah. Probably, man. Thank okay. you so much, Cheers, mate. Cheers, Dan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See you soon.